Hello and welcome back to Kiersey's virtual classroom. Now we're going to start talking about igneous rocks, which is the first type of rock that we will be talking about in this class. So igneous rocks, as you saw in the previous video, are formed from magma or lava. They either cool on the surface or they cool below ground. If they cool below ground, they are considered cooled from magma. If they cool on the surface, they're considered cooled from lava. The word igneous means fire. And all igneous rocks, whether they form on the surface or below the surface, will start deep in the earth as molten magma. So these rocks start molten or melted, and then they are either erupted or crystallized below ground, and they turn into solid rock. To classify igneous rocks, we use textural classification and compositional classification. When we talk about texture, we're not necessarily going to be talking about how the rock feels on the surface. It's going to be the size, shape, and arrangement of the grains, which will be the crystals on the rock. And then the composition will be what types of crystals do we see, what minerals do we see in this rock. Okay, so like I said, texture refers to the size, shape, and arrangement of the grains. So this is the crystals or the minerals in the rock, and I'll show you some examples in a second. The texture is important because it's primarily controlled by the cooling rate. So the faster that the rock cools, the smaller the grains are going to be. So you're going to have smaller crystals with a faster cooling rate. You're going to have larger crystals with a slower cooling rate. Crystals need time to grow. So if it crystallizes over a very slow period of time, then you're going to see very large crystals. So, for example, extrusive igneous rocks, which are the ones that come out of volcanoes, they form on the surface of the earth, and they are usually fine-grained. Okay, so they have very, very small crystals that you cannot see with the naked eye. Intrusive igneous rocks will cool below the surface, and they usually form coarse-grain igneous rocks. So these are going to have very large crystals in them. Okay, so looking at intrusive or plutonic igneous rocks, in a hand specimen, you'd actually be able to see the crystals. So in this photograph, you can see all of the crystals that are present. It shows you potassium feldspar, plagioclase feldspar, and quartz in relationship to the size of a dime. So you can kind of see that. And then in microscope, this is what you would see. The crystals just get even larger. Okay, so intrusive igneous rocks form underground in plutons. So we also call them plutonic igneous rocks. Extrusive or volcanic igneous rocks form at the surface. So they are erupted out of a volcano and then they crystallize and cool on the surface. So you see very small crystals. You don't see them with the naked eye, but with a microscope you can see them. So this is something like basalt, in hand specimen, you wouldn't be able to see the crystals, but under a microscope, you can see the crystals. Okay, so the crystals are too small to see without a microscope. So these are extrusive. They form out of a volcano on top of the surface. Another special type of texture is a porphyritic texture. A porphyritic texture has two different crystal sizes. So that means that you can, in a fine green porphyritic, you can see some crystals. So you see these black crystals here. So those are the visible crystals in hand specimen. And then everything that holds those crystals together are other crystals. They're just so small you can't see them. So they would be your non-visible crystals. You can only see them under a microscope. So a porphyritic texture has two different crystal sizes. In a fine grain porphyritic, you can see one size and you can't see the other, okay, in a hand specimen. With coarse grain porphyritic, you can see both sizes because it's coarse grain, so all of the crystals are visible. If all the crystals are visible in a specimen that you're looking at, that means that it's coarse grain. It's porphyritic if some of them are small and some of them are large. So this is two distinct crystal sizes all of which you can see, some are small, some are large. Okay, that's the coarse grain porphyritic. So how does the fine grain porphyritic work? So if I say that all of the fine grained 
textured rocks form at the surface, if it's porphyritic and some of the crystals are larger, that means that they've been growing for longer. So what happens in this situation is that some of the crystals are actually crystallizing before they've been erupted inside of the magma chamber. So you'd see a certain set of crystals that are spending more time crystallizing, so they end up larger than the rest of it, the rest of the magma that's then erupted out of the volcano. So there's a distinct different crystal sizes, which means there's different cooling rates in that rock. So for a fine grain porphyritic, we have some cooling on the inside of the magma chamber and some on the surface. With coarse grain porphyritic, everything is still crystallizing below ground, but the larger crystals that you see in a particular rock are crystallizing prior to the smaller crystals. So they started crystallizing first. Working on looking at a glassy texture, this happens when you have very rapid cooling. So it cools almost instantly and you get this very nice, glassy, smooth texture to the rock. Um, and it will shine like you see in this photograph. This is obsidian and this is made of basically all glass. It is glass. It's volcanic glass. Um, so a lot of it is uh, fairly silica rich. So you, if you have a very, very small piece of this, it's almost translucent. Um, but these do come out of volcanoes. Um, they would not form underground in a pluton. The next texture we're talking about is vesicular. So this one also will come out of a volcano. This would not be associated with plutons. So this is an extrusive igneous rock as well. And this vesicular texture forms when a particular lava has a lot of gas in it, that gas is trapped until the lava cools and solidifies into a rock, at which point all of the gases will escape into the atmosphere. And so you're left with these little vesicles or fossil bubbles that make the rock very, very light. It's not very dense at all. So have you ever seen somebody pull that trick where they see the floating rock in water? That's this rock, which is pumice, and the reason that it floats is because it's less dense than the water because of all the holes. And so a vesicular texture will be holes throughout the entire specimen. Okay, and it creates a very, very low density rock. And here you can kind of see in microscopic view how um, large and how frequent those vesicles are. Okay, so this isn't just like a couple of holes on the outside of the rock, it's completely throughout it. Um, and this is actually volcanic glass as well. It's just been su in such a gaseous state um, that you don't see the smooth uh, glassy texture like you do in obsidian. But uh, pumice is the rock that they will use on your feet to get rid of dead skin. Um, so you are, if you ever use a pumice stone, you're <laughs> using volcanic glass on your foot basically. Pyroclastic texture is another texture we will talk about. This comes out of a volcano as well. So this is an extrusive igneous rock texture. So with pyroclastic, pyro means fire and clastic means clasts of things, rock, debris, crystals. So pyroclastic texture is rocks that are mostly ash and some rock fragments or small crystals. So there's two types, we have tufts and we have branches. Tufts are mostly ash and sometimes they have small crystals in them. So you can kind of see some specks on here. And so it will have some small crystals, um, but very few rock fragments and mostly ash. Breccias have ash that are holding together larger rock fragments and sometimes some crystals as well. So both of these will feel very ashy. So you would enhance specimen if we got to actually hold them in class. You'd be able to um, feel the texture of that. You feel the ash coming off of um, the rock. Okay, so pyroclastic texture is mostly formed from volcanic ash and then depending on what it consists of inside of it, in addition to the ash, that will distinguish whether it's a breccia or a tuff. Okay, so looking at the Bowen's reaction series, we talked about this with crystals, but we're going to kind of relate it back to igneous rocks now. So in the Bowen's reaction series, 
we saw that olivine will crystallize first and at the highest temperature out of a magma, and that quartz will crystallize last, okay? So here we see, in addition, the separation of the different igneous rock types. So we have ultramafic, basaltic, or mafic, andesitic, which would be like intermediate, and then granitic, which we would use the term felsic. And I'll write those out for you in a second. So if we have a rock that is very high in quartz content, we would say that it's granitic or it's felsic. Here it has a rhyolite or a granite. Rhyolite would be your extrusive igneous rock. Granite would be your intrusive igneous rock. So if you're looking at something that's high in quartz content, but it has very small, fine-grained crystals, it's probably a rhyolite. If it's coarse grain, it would be a granite. If it's high in olivine, pyroxene, amphiboles, we would say that it's mafic or basaltic. And depending on whether it came out of a volcano or a pluton, you would say it's either basalt or gabbro. Basalt would be your extrusive or volcanic igneous rock. Gabbro would be your intrusive or plutonic igneous rock. Okay, And depending on the temperature of the magma, you're going to see different crystals and thus different rock types form. So remember, olivine is high in magnesium and iron, so the ultramafic and basaltic mafic rocks are going to end up being very dark in color, whereas quartz is high in silica and oxygen, so your felsic or granitic rocks are going to be very light in color. So remember, magnesium and iron make dark rocks, dark minerals and dark rocks. And silica and oxygen make light colored minerals and light colored rocks. Okay. So let's think about some of these rocks. So I have a lot of the most common rocks here that we will talk about in class. And I want you to go through and see what texture term you might assign to the samples, what crystals you might be able to see. If you can see any, if you can't see any, then just you know, mark in your notes, none. And then would you consider it to be mafic or felsic? Okay, so these are the terms that I was just saying, mafic and felsic. Mafic is high in magnesium and iron. Felsic is low in magnesium and iron. And they are high in silica and oxygen. Okay, so pause the video if you need to, and then I will continue. Okay, so let's start with the granite. So this guy up here, what do you notice about it? It's black and white. It has a little bit more white than, let's say, its neighbor diorite here. What texture term would you assign? Is this coarse grain, fine grain, pyroclastic, glassy, vesicular? I would say that this would be coarse grain. You can see all of the crystals. Okay. What crystals might you see? It might be really hard in a photograph, um, but from here, the white, creamy stuff that you can see are all the feldspars. The kind of glassy, transparent colors are the quartz. And then the black is biotite and hornblende. Okay, the difference between a granite and a diorite is that granite has quartz and diorite does not. Diorite has most of the same crystals that granite will have with the exception of the quartz. That's what separates the granite from the diorite. And would you consider this mafic or felsic? Well, it's really light in color. It has quartz in it, so we would consider it felsic, okay? Diorite would be your intermediate. So these three here, granite, diorite, and gabbro, are all coarse-grained igneous rocks. They all come from plutons. So gabbro, the photographs that I've found are not super great. It's really hard to see on a computer. I know hand specimens way better. But... Um, this photograph here, you can kind of see that there are grains here versus, let's say, the obsidian, right? You can see that there are crystals present. All of the crystals are very dark in color, um, so this has a lot of magnesium and iron in it. So gabbro would be the mafic coarse-grained endpoint of these three coarse grain. So granite is your felsic, diorite is an intermediate, and gabbro is your mafic, okay? Then moving down to the basalt andesite rhyolite down here, as you can tell, you can't see all of the crystals in these three, so these would all be considered fine-grained. So these are volcanic. So these are volcanic igneous rocks here. 
if you looked in a microscope, you'd actually be able to see the crystals. Um, some of them you can see in andesite here, but you can't see any in basalt, and rhyolite has a couple little specks of quartz. Okay, so I have these flipped here, so rhyolite is the lightest color here, which means that it is the felsic rock. So this one has quartz in it, rhyolite has quartz, andesite does not contain quartz. They both will often contain plagioclase feldspar, but in rhyolite, oftentimes you cannot see it. Andesite is more um, likely to show the feldspars, and that's what these white little specks are on this rock. So rhyolite is your felsic, andesite is your intermediate, and basalt would be your mafic. Okay, so these are your fine-grained igneous rocks. Okay, how about pumice? Pumice, fine grain, coarse grain, vesicular, right? We've already kind of talked about this one. This one is vesicular. You can see the holes throughout it. Scoria is also vesicular. You can kind of see the holes throughout it. Because these are primarily um, made of vesicles, you're not going to see a whole lot of crystals. And they come out of volcanoes. So you're not going to see crystals within these two samples. So moving on to the third question, would they be mafic or felsic? So Pumice is lighter in color than scoria, so pumice would be your felsic endpoint, and scoria would be your mafic endpoint of the vesicular textures. Okay, and then obsidian is your glassy texture. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit. You can kind of see that there's some shine. It looks like glass, so it is a glassy texture. Obsidian's a hard one because it looks black, and it does come out of a volcano, but if you um, get a very, very thin piece of it, you can see through it, and it is high in silica, which is making the glass. Okay, so obsidian would be on the felsic endpoint. Tufts and breccias. Remember, these are a, our pyroclastic texture rocks. Tuff having mostly ash with some crystals, and breccia having ash with rock fragments, okay? So here you may see some crystals. Um, in tufts, a lot of them, what you're gonna see is quartz, um, but a lot of times you don't necessarily see any particular crystals in them, especially if they're primarily ash and rock fragments, okay? And these two both look like they're somewhere in the felsic to intermediate range. Um, just based on their colors, right? So you can compare them to the rhyolite, granite, andesite, and diorites. So they're kind of in that range. They're not a very dark pyroclastic rock. Okay? All right, so once those rocks start weathering and eroding, which we're going to talk about with sedimentary rocks next, they will form soil that is relevant um, related to the color of the rock, right? So, for instance, if we have a basalt, like we see a lot in the Hawaiian Islands, you end up seeing black sand because the basalt is black that is formed from the Hawaiian volcanoes. And eventually it will weather and erode to sand that is black, right? It shouldn't change color for any particular reason. And in addition to basalt, the Hawaiian Islands also produce olivine, so a lot of the crystals that are associated with basalt are olivine, which is olive green, so you'll see green sand beaches. Less common than the black sand beaches, but <clears throat> they would still be present because you do have minerals that would that are this color in the rocks that are native to the island. Now, if you've ever been to Oahu, they have white sand at Waikiki Beach. So why do you think there would be white sand in Waikiki Beach? Where would it come from? California. So <laughs> California, as you probably are aware, has a lot of white sand beaches. And the white sand comes from the granite in the Sierra Nevada that has weathered and eroded and made it to our beaches. So our sand is gonna be primarily a white quartz sand. Now, in Hawaii, they have all basalt, so it should be green and black only. But in the 20s and 30s, it was assumed that tourists would not be interested in black or green sand beaches because they weren't as appealing as the California white sand beaches. 
So before the EPA was developed, um, Waikiki Beach was importing sand from Manhattan Beach in California. And then in the 1970s, when the Environmental Protection Agency was founded, they put a stop to that because the beach was starving. So Manhattan Beach was completely built on sand and the ecosystem there was very reliant on a particular amount of sand. And they took so much sand in the 20s and 30s that it started to starve the beach and they saw the ecosystem completely shift. Um, and so the EPA stepped in and changed all of that and made it so that you could not import from Manhattan Beach anymore, which was a really, really good thing. Um, so just keep in mind when we start talking about weathering and erosion, rocks should exhibit, or the sand that comes from the rocks exhibits the same color as the rocks they came from. Okay, so that's the end of igneous rocks, and I will see you guys in the next video.